Hello, welcome to Cutting Edge Integrative Pain Relief and Take Back Your Life Thursdays. Today, we are talking about how to fix your broken back. And uh, I am Dr. Orlando Landrum. Today, joined without a guest for a change, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how to be able to assess, evaluate what's going on with your broken back. So there's a couple different ways to be able to kind of evaluate and assess this. Um, the predominant among, amongst them is the following, is what does your back pain feel like? So first and foremost, what we really need to be able to do is to understand and evaluate what are the different options that are out there, as well as how to be able to assess your pain. So when we talk about this, there's a couple different resources. So for those of you who do not know, I am an integrative and regenerative medicine pain physician who treats a number of different types of problems. Uh, what we're talking about today is back pain, but we also treat knee pain, shoulder pain, elbow pain, all those different types of things. So if you have interest, by all means, tune in every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. If this is not a time that's convenient, by all means, check out our channel that will show the same thing that will be playing on our YouTube channel, as you can see below. So if you go to our YouTube channel, it will give you insight about the various different videos that we have in place, as well as the different topics that uh, help support and understand some of the items that are um, going on right now. So let's kind of get into the aspect of the spine, talk about the back a little bit more, and have some understanding about really what are we talking about when we talk about the context of uh, a broken back. So first and foremost, one thing that we need to really kind of define is the element of, so what are the bones that are present in the back that can potentially break? So we talk about that. We can kind of look at a traditional spine and we obviously have a cervical spine that's in place right here. We have a thoracic spine that's in place right here. And then we have a lumbar spine that's in place right here. So <clears throat> within the context of the aspect of the spine, we have each one of those individual bones are something that's called the vertebrae. And we've talked about this before in other different uh, YouTube videos that we've published and put forth. And so some of those that are, have been uh, a specific discussion about those different types of elements are gonna be things like a channel, like one of our videos, such as this. It is uh, for patients broken back. Uh, if you go to our YouTube channel and find that video, I'll talk to you a little bit in depth and detail about it. But what we're gonna do is show you some of that context today. So let's say we looked at a more defined spine model, right? Here you can be able to see the vertebral body that's present here. You can be able to see the disc that's present here, which is not a different color in this particular model, but we'll show it in just a second or so. If we were to turn this upside down, the blue markings that you can be able to pick out here is representative of the spinal cord, right? And then coming off of that spinal cord is the context of the different nerve roots that you see that should be present on both sides, right? And so if you were to take a look, you can see you have that aspect of the nerve root that's present here. And if you flip it to the other side, you can see the presence of the nerve root here, right? So when we talk about a broken back, one of the things that we're most concerned about is whether this bone, this vertebral bone, ends up breaking in some fashion. So if you think about that, what is that gonna look like? What it's gonna look like is probably something like this. So you think about it and you're like, oh my God, could that potentially happen to my back? Is that what it looks like? Am I gonna have a problem like that? Well, if that is indeed the case, most people would say, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna be able to manage that. How can I be able to deal with some context of a broken back that has like my, all my bones just going every different which way? Well, that's not really quite the way it looks. Actually, it looks more like this. So if we were to take a look at this, you can kind of see that blue arrow pointing in. You can see that there's a collapse of the vertebral body that's in place. So if we were to take a look at another model to kind of show this to you a little bit better, it looks more kind of of this nature. So let's say that you have this sitting right here. If you were to identify the aspect of the bone here and you take a look at the disc, the, the blue structure in this particular model, the bone itself becomes depressed. And so if you go to our webpage and sign up for our newsletter, you can actually be part of our blog that gives a couple more insights than what we're gonna talk about today about a compressed vertebral body 
if we're using the exact wording for it, the fancy terminology, it's something that's called a vertebral compression fracture. By all means, if thank you for joining. If you have questions, just post them and we'll answer those questions as they come in and kind of give you some insight about what we're talking about. So vertebral compression fractures can occur from a number of different manners. The first is that you can have a traumatic event so that you had a fall or an injury or something hit your back and then you had that fracture of the bone, meaning so you ended up getting something that resulted in something like this, right? Or you have that depression that looks like that. Or if you're looking at it in more cartoon form, it looks something kind of like this, where you have that compression fracture that takes place and then you have this resulting um, issue with the bone. As I'm sure most people could probably guess, if you were to have something like that, it can be painful. Not only can it be painful, it can also influence other particular joints and other problems to occur that's associated in alignment with that aspect of that vertebral body. So one of the things that can take place is so if you have that compression fracture that's present here, right? One thing that you can see is that it can change the bone above and the bone below it in terms of the alignment. Also, it can influence the aspect of the disc in a lot of different ways. So <clears throat> with that, is it possible for you to have a fracture of your back and not know it? Yeah, it most certainly is possible to be able to have that fracture of the back, not be able to under, not be able to be aware that you had that actual bone crack and that is potentially causing you some of your challenges. So one of the things that would really go a long way is to have an understanding of Okay, if that was to take place, how could I be able to identify it if I didn't know anything about it? Would a simple x-ray show it? Yeah, a simple x-ray could potentially show it. The question is, is, is your doctor well aware enough to be able to assess something like that and get the x-ray? So if they are and you have a, suspect, a, a suspicion, then yeah, you get the x-ray, you see that it's in place. So then becomes the question of if there's a fracture that's present, what can you do about it? So what can you do about it is a couple different things. And for us as a practice, we do some things that are a little bit unique, but traditionally you can go one of two ways, but we offer more than two ways. We offer three or four in addition to the two ways that you talk about. So the first is you could just leave it alone and not do anything with it. And if you were to do that, does it give you any degree of benefit? Well, the problem is it's pretty painful, particularly when you turn and when you move, when you go backwards, when you go forwards, all those type of things can cause some problems and some issues. So sometimes people will try to brace, a hard brace to prevent you from having that problem and try and take some pain medicines. Well, depending on you and your age and how well you tolerate pain, uh, that can be a tough one. And sometimes it'll take a few months to get back to really where you need to be. The other option is to do something that is called a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. And in essence, what it entails is basically you have a special type of trocar or needle that goes into that bone. And if it's a vertebroplasty, what takes place is as that needle enters into the aspect of the bone, as we kind of take a look like this, right? As it enters into the bone, you place a special type of medical grade um, cement in essence, and it hardens that area and makes it better. For a kyphoplasty, it's a little bit different. So if you were to take a look at the model and you could see that this was compressed down, what has taken place is you place a needle into the area and then you expand it with a couple different types of devices. The most common and most longstanding has been one of a balloon in order to be able to make it open. And so when you open that area, you can be able to then fill it with cement and it gets a much more even grade of distribution. So we actually have a, a comment coming in and it's from Jesse Valdez who says, are there artificial replacement bones that are being used are made of some other uh, type of composite material? It's a very good question. Thank you for fielding it. I didn't prompt that question from you. Well, that's actually pretty interesting because what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about is, so what can be done besides the traditional cement, right? So those are things that we do in our practice but aren't necessarily commonly done elsewhere. So there's different types of polymer that you can inject, as well as there are polymers that have an elasticity that mimics that of bone. One of the reasons why kyphoplasty had issues and vertebroplasty had issues before in the past is there were concerns about when you put the cement in, is the cement that you place within the aspect of the vertebral body, 
harder than the other areas. So then you place like a heavy bowling ball and you put it on an empty shoe box and then it collapses. So the way that that's been addressed is either by number one, making the bowling ball potentially lighter or number two saying, let's not use a bowling ball. Let's use something like a tennis ball that can be able to then provide structure and support that mimics bone, but is not so heavy that it compresses all the other levels that are below. Again, if this is something that you really want to kind of get the nuanced pieces and have a better understanding about what's going on and how to really be able to get the better, easier understanding of kyphoplasties and vertebroplasties, go to our YouTube video and check out this particular video of four patients, broke bone in the back, also known as a vertebral compression fracture. We'll give you a better idea about all the different nuances in a quick kind of like fast fashion. But we want to talk to you about if so, last week we had uh, one of our uh, docs on that talked to us specifically about the aspect of regenerative medicine. And so when if you go to this, we have covered a whole host of different topics, but we really kind of avoided spine, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing this talk today, because we typically every week have a guest uh, visitor who kind of talks about what it is that they do. And I wanted to kind of fill in the gap for some of the things that we do. So our practice is predominantly based on how can we treat pain and how can we treat pain of the spine everything from the neck all the way down to the tailbone that's really what we do and we're going to talk a little bit about some other innovative interesting things that are close to this because when many people think about broke back they don't just think about the compression fracture that i'm showing you in these various different pictures that pop up like this right when they think about a broke back they think about hey my back is bent over i'm hurt i can't move i can't twist i can't turn and so what are some of the causes of that? So we actually have a video that talks about the four most common causes on the YouTube channel that goes in and gives insight about things like the concept of muscle sprain, facet joint pain, discogenic pain, and spinal stenosis. And so when you listen to that video on the YouTube channel, it'll give you some understanding. But one of the things we really wanna understand is besides muscle sprain, which is typically going to be kind of that contracted muscles. And there's a number of videos that we're going to be coming out about how we can make those muscle spasms better. How can we be able to improve that? How can we stop it really quickly? And the concept of talking about facet joints. So again, when we talk about a facet joint, what we're talking about is the joints that really are involved in here. It's what allows for the spine to be able to bend, to be able to twist, for you to be able to turn. Those joints that are pre present are what allow for the mobility and motor and function for how you're able to really have appropriate locomotion. Most people traditionally have pain within the context of a facet joint. It normally is a problem that's present within the back that typically is worse when you go from a seated to standing position. It's worse if you're a golfer, a gardener, uh, a manual laborer, if you do any of those type of things. And so it can contribute to that feeling of a quote unquote pro broke back. Spinal stenosis is a little bit different. Uh, we've talked about this and there's other videos that really kind of go into depth and detail about this, but it's mainly the aspect of you having pain when you stand and when you walk. When you sit, the pain gets better. When you stand, it's worse. And discogenic pain is a little bit different, but it's focused on the context of the disc. So <clears throat> when we talk about this, really does regenerative medicine have a role in this? Can we be able to say the things that we talked about previously for regenerative medicine, things like PRP, things like potentially stem cells, are those things that can be able to provide value? And they most certainly can. We're one of the few practices that do things like that. And so why would you wanna consider that as opposed to a traditional cement or try to say, let's cover it up with either meds or steroid? Well, one of the reasons why is number one, it's autologous. And as we've discussed before, autologous means that it comes from you. And there's a number of different reasons why that's better. But one of the primary reasons why it's better is that you know you're not going to really have any infection that's going to come from someplace else. Number two, you're not going to have a rejection of, it, of the tissues. And number three, your healing is more than likely going to be much more robust because we're using tissue that comes from you. So that's one of the reasons why you may want to consider using an autologous type treatment, a regenerative medicine type treatment. But then in addition to that, is that as we talked about that modified component, as Jesse asked before of us talking about, hmm, well, if you have an artificial cement, is there anything that can mimic that area? Yes, there are. 
in essence, there are things that you can be able to do by using your own cells, your own tissue, and be able to get to that area and replenish it and get back to the area of what it felt like before. So as we kind of go into this, if you really have interest about vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, check out that one video that I referred to before. Or if you have some interest and you really want to kind of know about what we're doing on a weekly basis, by all means, go to our newsletter and sign up for it. The banner that's ticking down below will kind of give you some insight about that. It will give you an understanding on a weekly basis about some of the different offerings that are out there. But the but pure and simple, when we talk about um, vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, we have an upcoming blog piece that's going, going to go into depth and detail. And that's something that we do at our practice. Most people think that it has to be done at a hospital. It is not. We can actually be able to do it in office, give you sedation and be able to treat you appropriately. And so if that's something that occurs to you or someone that you love, by all means, reach out to us and let us know. For us, we're following a pretty intense COVID uh, protection policy so that some of the things that you might have at a surgery center or at the hospital, we can be able to reduce your risk by a fair margin. So what are some of the other innovative things when we talk about broke back uh, that are really out there? And given that we are our cutting edge integrative pain centers and what we talk about is cutting edge pain relief on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook channel, what are some of the things that are coming down the pipe that really may be of use and of interest for someone that feels like they have a broke back? But one of the things that's been out there for quite some time is the following. If you take a look at this picture, you can be able to see that there is an x-ray picture on the right-hand side that shows a spine model and it shows two lines that are coming in. So these two lines are needles that are coming into the axis of the disc. So if you look at the cartoon model on the left-hand side, you can see these probes coming in as opposed to them coming into the bone like they would with a vertebral kyphoplasty. Instead, they come into the disc. Well, the question would be is why would you do that? Well, there's a heat that's conducted between the two tips of the needle that can be able to deal with the posterior annular fibers of the disc and stop those areas from being painful. So why would you want to consider doing something like that? Well, the reason why you would want to consider doing something like that is if you have something like discogenic pain. And so that was one of the four things that I made mention of before with the four most common videos, right? Our four most common causes of back pain in this video, right? So if we want to talk about the elements of how to be able to deal with discogenic pain, that particular treatment is one of the things that you can do. It's a needle placement into the aspect of the disc and under sterile conditions, and you apply heat to really make that disc a little bit more firm and stop the nerve fibers from having that sensation that they had before. So that's one of the treatments that's out there. But there's actually a more interesting and new novel treatment that's out there that we are one of the few practices that actually perform it here in this area. And that's something that's called the intracept procedure. You're not going to hear about this too commonly. As you can see, there's four different pictures that are up. The four different pictures are numbered one, two, three, and four from a left to right, from the top down to the bottom. And what it shows is, in essence, a similar type treatment, the same way as vertebral kyphoplasty is. It goes into the bone, but it's a slightly different angle. And the reason why it's going into the bone is not to damage or change the bone but more so to be able to change the aspect of this structure, which is that yellow star structure in the center. That is a vertebral basilar nerve. And so to kind of uh, divest or diverge for just a quick second, that nerve has been suspected to be involved in much back pain and has been undiagnosed for years. They've had a study going on, give or take, for about the last five to seven years or so, where they've treated patients in um, a research trial with what I'm about to explain. And what was originally thought was that the facet joint, as I mentioned to you before, let me see if I can find that model real quick. That joint type area in here, or the nerve root that's in place in here, or the central spinal cord, or the vertebral body, that these are the areas that are causing most pain. And what we think is just like how you have that fracture that's present in the back for the aspect of kyphoplasty, is maybe it's much more involved than what we originally surmised. And what I mean by that is the following, is perhaps 
that the aspect of these vertebral bodies that are in place, that maybe these vertebral bodies have more of an impact on the disc than what we originally thought was the case. So <clears throat> the premise is, is that instead of us just treating a disc herniation or disc pain, one of the things that we really want to get understanding about is if we treat the bone, does that bone then end up making the disc feel better? And undoubtedly, from what we've been able to see under the right circumstances, when we identify there's a bone issue, they've been seeing success rates of 90% across all comers that have lasted for greater than five years. There's very few things that are out there that provide something of that ilk. And the fact of the matter is to have that type of treatment you don't need fusion. You don't need hardware. You don't need metal put into your back because that's not what this is about. This is about a minimally invasive way in order to be able to treat the context of the bone by going after the nerve root that's causing the pain. You place a small needle into the space, you use a special type of catheter that goes here and that catheter that's present then touches in and around that area of the nerve. It applies heat and it stops this nerve from complaining and giving issues and problems with pain. That's what the intercept procedure happens to be. In the aspect of comments, one of the questions that's come up has been the following is what is the recovery time if this is an outpatient procedure? So we've covered a lot of different topics in terms of this aspect of broke back. Initially, we started with the components of vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty. So in answering that question, there are many people that get a kyphoplasty, which is really the predominant treatment of choice of what it is that we do. If we're using cement, they normally will actually feel pain, some pain relief rather, sometimes before they get off the table. But typically, you're going to have an idea about feeling better within the first two to three days or so. If we're talking about the aspect of thermobacuplasty, which is that context of the treatment that we talked about with this, right? It takes a little bit of time um, for that component of the disc to heal and get uh, better in place. But normally you're gonna see results, give or take within the context of a week to maybe two weeks or so. It mimics some of the things that you see with a traditional radio frequency ablation of the facet joints. Things like what we would commonly do when people say they're gonna quote unquote burn nerves, but that's not really what we're talking about burning. We're talking about burning the nerves in a specific area not the big nerves that you would see that come out of the foramen, not these nerves, more so nerves that sit within the context of the joint, or in this particular case, within the context of the disc. So <clears throat> the other procedure, the intercept procedure that I talked about here, if this was to be treated and uh, were to go after that basal vertebral nerve, the time frame is actually pretty darn short as well it's going to be easily within the context of two to four weeks is when you're going to start to see some degree of benefit as a potential measure. There are certain things we would need to identify and look at, but be that as it may, those are things that are really a critical piece of what we add in terms of different treatment options that are in place that can be able to provide value, that can be able to help people get back to being able to do what it is that they want to do, to be able to punch pain in the face and really take control of your life. If we want to talk about how to be able to prevent some of the things that can occur, there's a number of different videos that can kind of give you some insight about that. But the fact of the matter is when we look at how to be able to prevent back pain, there's a few different things that are key. Number one is looking at your diet and exercise activity. So diet, frequently individuals are not taking enough calcium or magnesium, and calcium doesn't have to mean that you're taking only or at all the aspect of milk or dairy products. Pardon me. You can be able to get some of those same things by utilizing the aspect of leafy green vegetables to be able to provide your body the need for the various different minerals and other ions and elements of a healthy nutritious diet. Number two is the aspect of exercise and activity. So that exercise and activity can be incredibly useful to be able to protect elements of the bone, elements of the joints, elements of the disc. So when you're providing exercise, it increases the overall demand, but it also makes the areas stronger and much more likely to be less responsive and less, un less unable to be able to sustain various different insults to them. <clears throat> so that's probably the first caveat of how you can be preventative. Additionally, is to know something about your family history. 
So if you have a history of disc pain, if you have an history of history of osteoporosis, which is the thing of the bone, there are things that you can do to be able to implement changes for you that weren't the same in your family. And then finally is by having a good collegial relationship with your physician, your primary care physician. If you have an interventional or regenerative medicine specialist like I am, to be able to have those individuals looking into what is the causative area as opposed to just telling you no, this is not an issue, it's just all in your head, don't believe that this is a pain problem, that's not the kind of uh, collegial discussion you really want to be able to have with your doc about how to be able to solve and address problems. So in, a, in summary, really what we talked about today was kind of a quick run through of vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty in the context of um, vertebral compression fractures. So what does that mean? Again, refer to that one video that talks about a broke bone in the back, how to be able to repair it, how to prevent you from having long-term issues accordingly so you don't have problems in other parts of the spine, so it doesn't affect, affect the aspect of your breathing and make it more difficult for you to be able to walk. We touched very briefly on the context of other pain issues that you might have in your back, things that are going to be like facet disease, muscle sprain, spinal stenosis, discogenic pain, and knowing that we can start from a minimally invasive basis and use regenerative medicine as a primary treatment model. But then if need be, we can use other elements of how to be able to intervene and make the spine better. We talked very briefly about the aspect of thermal biacoplasty. And in addition, we talked about intercept. So thermal biacoplasty, doing a procedure that targets the disc from two sides, and then the aspect of uh, intercept, which targets into the bone and targets the nerve to the bone. And it's traditionally a one needle type approach that the recovery phase for all of these are pretty short easily and underneath the aspect of a month um, pain relief can be pretty darn significant and quite frankly is maybe one of the safer choices and options that you may want to pursue so again i'm dr orlando landrum from cutting edge pain relief wanting to give you some insight about back pain and how to be able to deal with a broke back what are your options what are your choices how to prevent it if you find this of value then by all means, please look at coming and checking us out every Thursday and take back your life Thursdays. And if you feel that you might be able to get some benefit from looking at some of our other videos, what I would have you do is to take a look at our YouTube channel and subscribe. It's, it would be incredibly useful to give you further insight about other treatment options. If you want more of a uh, in-depth discussion about current topics and really want to have an idea about what are some of the, what's some of the literature show, by all means, check out the other banner that's going to be scrolling right now, which is our newsletter, and go to this link, and it'll give us insight about what are some of your issues and problems and how to be able to manage pain from a different way. So there's a question that's posed of how many of these are done in office. Um, well, it kind of depends on what we're talking about. I mean, normally what we're going to do is take this on a case-by-case -case basis because <clears throat> there are different complexities that are involved. Are we talking about doing sedation? Do we have various different issues and challenges with you having one level, multiple levels? Are there other more confounding events? Is it a mixed picture with other things going on in your body like knee and hip? How can we be able to assess and address some of those things? And what have we done previously in the past? So in mixture of all of that, that's where things kind of get a little bit more convoluted. So I thank you for your time. Again, if there are questions that you guys have, don't hesitate to ask going forward in the future. Um, and please join us every week for this commentary about how to be able to address various different problems that you might have with a cutting edge, integrative pain approach. Please tune in and know that we value and we wanna help you be able to punch pain in the face and get back to leading the life that you deserve. Thank you so much and have a great day.